for the one apartment is the electric. Do they take care of that? I thought about that. Yo, I was in the shower and I was thinking That's about that. That's a good that. question. Was, because we already yo, we gave him a thousand when, dollars. Like. When you're in real estate and you're doing business, you'll think of things in the shower before mm -hmm. you go to sleep in your <laughs> dreams. <laughs> you're like, did I do that? <laughs> Wholesaling is still the one of the best options you can do. Really I wasn't cool. dedicated. I wasn't consistent. But if you are even like persistent with that, it can take a long time. Why I also recommend like if you're doing a fix and flip, try to get an inspection done on the property. We don't do that. Um, we just bring our contractor and we just we just trust God we just hope that he knows what he's doing <laughs> which he does he's a great guy welcome back to the Investor Unite podcast where we talk all things real estate business and entrepreneurship if you are looking to unite your real estate investing then join us on Investors Unite and on today's podcast I have one that is pretty exciting I'd like to say so you definitely want to stick around it's going to be a mix of entertainment with education. Mm -hmm. um, today's topic is basically active income versus passive income. Yeah. And the way that we're going to kind of format this is it's going to be in a debate style. So we just had our presidential debate. <laughs> somebody got destroyed, somebody won. So that was kind of cool. Yeah. And we're going to see what happens here. Although, you know, just to say it, we both kind of agree with the same things. Mm -hmm. So it was a little bit difficult trying to figure out who's going to argue which side because one of us didn't want the one side <laughs> but, <laughs> but no I'm excited so it's going to be Stephanie is going to be arguing for active income so that mm -hmm. will include wholesaling novations fix and, fix and flips yeah um anything of that nature and then myself I'll be arguing for rental properties and kind of just like the different ways to acquire those and what the benefits and mm -hmm. some of the cons might be of both yeah so I'll argue the benefits you can tell me the cons and I'll see if I can contradict those all right so yeah I did not. He he said he over here was studying and stuff. Like <laughs> I didn't study too much to be honest. Which I'm I, like I'm just going off the dome. Like <laughs> <laughs> so I was like I was just trying to touch base a little bit. I was going through and watching some videos today. Mm -hmm. Just like what are all the different methods of income generating things? I guess you could say for rental properties. Like yeah. what are the different ways to make income um, versus like a fix and flip and like right. in terms of like taxes and like other stuff. Like I want to make sure that I knew what I was talking about. Yeah. Just so that, you know, whatever I say is hopefully correct for the most part. For the so, viewer. Yeah. yeah. So let's, I guess, start off with the you easiest, you, can you know, start. The, the easiest method and some would say the best method just because it's risk free, sure. which is wholesaling. Wholesaling. So what is wholesaling? Wholesaling. So basically... Wholesaling, just to break it down, easy terms, you find a distressed property, you reach out to the seller, seller wants to sell, you get a purchase and sell contract with you and the seller, and then you have equitable interests within that property there for you to be able to market it and find a buyer. Let's say you and the seller agreed to the price of 100000 you go and find a buyer for 110000 then you give that buyer an assignment agreement, mm -hmm. um, which you are assigning your rights of that initial purchase and sale contract to them. They sign that, you make 10K. Literally, that's simple. That's simple. So, I mean, there's two different ways you can do assignment uh, wholesale deals is you can assign it or you can do a double close. Mm -hmm. Now, with the assignment, the buyer is going to see how much you make and the seller will see how much you make. Yeah. But for a double close, that's where they don't see that stuff, gotcha, which is gotcha. nice. Is that would that be the only reason to do a double close? Is just so that the either party could see what you had purchased it for? Honestly, it's it for? it's up to you and the seller. I okay. mean, whatever. Like for us, we we do a lot of double closes. I don't know. It just feels more. It feels more appropriate because yeah. it's like okay, we actually have some skin in the game at this point. We actually went through and did purchase the property, like we were saying. Mm -hmm. Whether or not we turn around and resell it or not, I mean, that's completely up to us once it's our property. Yeah. So I feel like it's just a little bit more morally, mm -hmm. you know, acceptable. But at the same time, if the seller and the buyer are both aware of what your profit margin is. What you're is, making, then it's like, then once again, might as well just do an assignment. Okay. Because yeah. double closes, um, just a little backstory with double closes, you're going to have to pay double, you know, with fees when it comes to closing. So just be aware of that. Yep, yep. But um, in regards to like pros, so I'm basically going over my pros with wholesaling. <laughs> so number one, I like it where it's an easily like scalable business model. It is. Um, I used to be like not a numbers person and I'm still like not the best numbers person, 
Um, but I love to look at the numbers and look at the KPIs and see like, okay, last week we did this. Now let's push, let's make more calls. Let's, you know, make more offers, send out more contracts and just scale that way. And then whatever we see is working, just double down on that. So I like personally, I just like seeing that and I like being able to scale a company. Um, yeah. So, I mean, that's a pro just for me because that's what I like. <laughs> right. And why is it such a great way to get started if you were a complete beginner? Yeah. So besides like scaling. Right. So another pro is you don't need your real estate license. You can literally just start tomorrow yeah. um, with cold calling. You do need some money. There's, you know, videos out there like you don't need any money to start. But in reality, like you can go drive for dollars and find a distressed property and stuff like that. Call up a seller. Um, but you will need some money just for that earnest money deposit, which yeah, it could be as little as 20 bucks. It could be a dollar, honestly. Could be a dollar. I, I could be a penny. Yeah, we did it on one of our properties. Yeah. We did a dollar. <laughs> so we <were> broke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we did a dollar EMD and everything was cool. So yeah, a lot of times all the, you uh, need is a dollar to start wholesaling real estate. You know, <laughs> And you need a contract. And you need a contract, which you can get from like you know, an attorney or your title company and stuff like that. So super low barrier to entry. Um, that's why I believe it's great. Um, now, if you are looking to scale, you are going to need like a dialer. Um, what else? It depends if you want to get into like probates, you can get mailers, stuff like that. Yeah, it just comes down to whatever you prefer in Texting. terms of marketing. Yeah, the platforms is what's going to cost you a good amount of money. Um, but overall, low barrier to entry. Um you could get a deal literally next week and make five, 10K and then just keep doing it, recycling the process. That's such a clip right there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you want to know uh, the cons, in my opinion, to wholesaling? Yeah, what's the cons? All right. So how long did it take us to close our first wholesale deal? Mm. I know you know. Exactly from us partnering. From us partnering, yeah. So we partnered in like... February or March of 2022 and we got our deal closed um it was like early July of 2022 or it was end of June really mm -hmm. when we for whatever reason I thought it took like we were like nine months deep and so we closed our first deal no I mean for me like I knew about wholesaling yeah um even before I got my license I knew about wholesaling and I would do it on and off on and off so so for it you, took, it's like, it, took it was a long, long time frame, it but you weren't really, really like, long. You weren't dedicated to it. I like wasn't that. dedicated. I wasn't consistent. But if you are even like persistent with that, it can take a long time. But that's your side. That's your side. Yeah. So I'm going to kind of combat this mm -hmm. in the way of risk, right? Mm -hmm. So yes, it is risk-free mm -hmm. per se because you don't have much capital into the deal. Right. right. Uh, it could be as little as a dollar, as you were saying. Yeah. What I will say, though, in terms of risk is time because mm -hmm. time is money, right? Yeah. And it does take a lot of time in order to go ahead and build that list to go through, skip trace it, call all the owners, mm -hmm. have your follow-ups, set the appointments, get the contract signed, yeah. then to take that contract and dispo it to your end buyer and then send those to the title company and another 30 days typically until that actually closes. Mm -hmm. So it's risk-free in the time in the way of capital, but not in terms of time. The other thing is that this can be this is gonna kind of be my argument actually for all of the active income streams is you do that one deal, that's it. That, that is true. That's your lump sum. That's true. Where it's like, yes, it's very nice and everyone loves seeing those big checks, mm -hmm. but at the same time, it's, you're not getting that check every month unless you're continuously working for it. So in that manner, it's kind of more of a job than right. it is actually being an investor. So I don't know. <laughs> that's, that's kind of just where I see it, where it's like, no, I absolutely use wholesaling. I completely agree. Wholesaling yeah. is a great method, especially, I mean, even if you're going for fix and flips, but let's say you find a property that, you know, it might not be in an area that you specialize in or you might not have contractors in that area. Wholesaling is still the one of the best options you could do. It's like, okay, you bought a discount enough to be to do a flip on the property. Mm -hmm. You know, either sell it at that price, or I mean, a little bit more than what you had it on your contract for, or renegotiate to get five k off, and then just resell it for what you're already going to buy it for. Yeah, to a buyer. So it's like wholesaling. It's kind of a great exit strategy, even if you were looking to do a flip or buy it as a burst strategy or rental property. So. Now, now I will say 
wholesaling is like the foundation of everything. So the pro with this is you're going to develop that skill of being able to find deeply discounted properties, it's True. which you can also utilize can, the method yeah. to be able to find great properties for your, you know, not just for other investors, but most importantly for yourself to start building yeah. a portfolio or whatever you plan to do or fix and flip, you know, with those properties. So you can make even more of a spread. Right. Um, now with that, it's, it's nice because although you are, it's a one and done, you can still s stack up so much cash where you can utilize that money to stocks if that's what you want, or if you want to go into rental properties or, um, I mean, there's so many different yeah, options out there. What you can syndications, you can set your money towards. Yeah, absolutely yeah. anything. Um, no, that's a good point. So I'm going to argue the fact that buying rental properties is better. Okay. That's it. That's all I got. No, I'm just <laughs> So um, there's different ways to acquire these rental properties, right? Yeah. Obviously, there's a very traditional method mm -hmm. where you can go through, save up your 20% down, which technically does not be 20%, whatever loan program you're going through, or even if it's private money, right? Mm -hmm. um, but anyways, buying pretty much a turnkey property, calculating what your mortgage and expenses on that property would be, making sure that you can rent it out for more than that number, and then simple as that. So you're putting down a lump sum of money to gain, hopefully, a couple hundred dollars per month of pure cash flow right. at the end of the day. The nice thing about that is that there's, you're not making money in a one-time deal. Mm -hmm. At that point, you're actually then having the residual income coming in. So that's like where the term passive comes in because... But is it really residual? Is it really active It's income? really residual. Yeah. But it's not really passive. Or passive. I said active. <laughs> yeah, I said active. No, it's not very passive from our experience. Mm -hmm. um, maybe once you get to a higher level and you have an in-house property management team and you kind of build out the entire system... At that point, I'm sure it can become more passive. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's ever 100% passive. Right. Because you are going to have issues. Like, there's things... You just gonna... lost this whole argument. Well, no. I'm not done yet. <laughs> I'm not done. Hold on. <laughs> um, in terms of... Well, I guess the argument really has to stem to what is your goal as well, though. Mm -hmm. So, like, if your goal is to quit your 9 to 5, right? Let's just use that as an example where there's a million other things it could be. By doing this strategy enough times, you're yeah. going to eventually build up enough income to supplement what you're currently making from your job. So you're able to retire from that side. Okay. Well, right. in regards to that right there. Yeah. Just just from you're saying how much are you cash flowing a month per unit? Well, let's just say it's 300 bucks. 300 bucks. Okay. What did we just have to deal with? Literally yesterday, a hot water heater just hot went out. Heater. Yep. Rafael was like, got to get a new one. Right. So we got to do what you got to do. It's That's true. 600 bucks. So if you literally buy that, you're already eating from your cash flow. You're negative that month. That's true. Yeah. Are you really negative though? Are you? Because you have the rest of that tenant's income or the tenant's monthly payment mm -hmm. is going towards your mortgage. So at the same time, sure, you might not be making any money on top of it. But even if you quote unquote break even, mm -hmm. that monthly payment is still being paid down, which is technically equity then going into your pocket. So it's like you are going to have some of those expenses that are fairly a bit larger. Mm -hmm. And sure, that might put you extremely in the negatives. But it really comes to a delayed gratification where once you finally do have a good tenant in place, you have every CapEx item fixed up in the property, which it should be as soon as you rent it out. Like don't rent out to don't rent a property that's not ready to be rented out to somebody because mm -hmm. you're going to just have these issues. And that's something that we've experienced too, like later on, such as like the water heater, for example. We didn't know it was going to go bad. But it obviously didn't look brand new by any mm -hmm. means. So those are just things that you want to make sure that you have situated and completed before you even rent out the property. But over a longer period of time, I mean, those properties are going to be well worth the headache in the beginning mm -hmm. of having the tenants and everything. Especially once you start scaling to you're at 50 properties, 100 properties, 1,000 properties, 10,000 properties. Yeah. You're going to build out that team, and that money is going to be extremely passive. But... To contradict myself. No, not even. <laughs> kind of just like, I don't know, I don't know where I want to go with this because there's so many different strategies to talk about when it comes to buying rental properties. But look, if someone has a full-time job and they're about to buy a rental property and they don't got time to manage it, they they just hire a property management company, don't, that's already eating that. in their cash flow. Like that's you're done. And then yeah. something goes all you know wrong, 
Yeah. You're really done. Like no, absolutely. <laughs> and don't <laughs> don't hire property management for your first couple properties. Mm -hmm. Do that on your own. See. But what if they don't have time? Everyone has time. That's BS if you say you don't have time. Yeah. If I can work a full-time job, do wholesaling, flipping, novations, and rental properties, mm -hmm. manage all of it, you got time. Right. I understand I don't have a family. Well, I don't have my own family yet. Mm -hmm. I know that's something that people like to use as an excuse. But instead of saying, I can't do it, just say, how can I do it? Yeah. And then you'll figure it out. If you really want it, you get it done. Yeah, it's kind of like my motivational speech before we came here. Yeah. It's like, you got to want it, not just like it. That was my uh, senior quote. What? You got to want, want it. Want it. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and besides looking at it from just a cash flow standpoint, though, mm -hmm. these passive income properties, you're actually generating a lot more income in different ways than you're even thinking about. So, for example, let's say you did start off wholesaling and everything. You realize mm -hmm. this is a job. This is not something that's going to retire me. Honestly, wait a second. Let's go back to that because we can have this fully automated with wholesaling where it's not a job. You're just the boss and you're sure. overlooking everything. So there's people that work one hour a week on their business and they're making six figures a month. That is true. It so takes there a, you go. It does take a while to yeah. get there, but so does rental properties. Right? I wouldn't say it takes a while. It depends on where you're at in the beginning. Like if you start from the jump with like 50K oh, just to start with wholesaling, you may be able to start you know, getting deals like that left and right. It just yeah. all depends your entry of what, like how much money you have from the jump. Yeah, not invest. only that, but also I feel like a lot of it comes to knowledge and just your experience too. It's like, sure, you could have $100,000 that you can throw into a bunch of softwares and hiring out people mm -hmm. to try to automate this business as much as possible. But at the same time, if you haven't already done it for a substantial amount of time beforehand, mm -hmm. your business is going to fail no matter how much money you throw at it. And th I mean, that's why I recommend if you have money to start with real estate wholesaling, do not like go and get a dialer right away or go, you know, get SMS platforms. Start with getting a mentor like so you can shrink the the learning process, the learning curve or whatever you want to call it yeah. and start getting deals <clears throat> sooner. Because if you just start on your own, you're definitely going to be doing things wrong and then. You're going to wonder why, like, why is it taking it me many... eight, nine, ten months just to get this deal? But if yeah. you got that mentor, they're going to give you the full-on game plan, and you just have to copy and paste. So Yeah, kind of to go along with that, it also doesn't matter actually how much you learn, like, mm -hmm. in terms of watching content and listening to these mentors. But you're not going to know the full spectrum of it until you actually jump into it and yeah. start, you know, with doing your own wholesale deals and everything. Um, cause there's so many different scenarios that could pop up that you've never heard of in a video or maybe it's something in a contract that you've never seen before or heard of before, mm -hmm. you know, there's all kinds of different things that could happen. So really it's just taking the action to get started. Yeah. It was now, a little tangent, but if you want to go back to your, no, I agree. Um, yeah. What was I talking about? Oh, your the pros of rentals. Yeah. So along with just the cash flow, let's hope it's cash flow. Mm -hmm. Um, you're also sometimes buying these properties and something that we like to do a lot is the burst strategy. Mm -hmm. Now, by implementing the burst strategy, you're actually doing a lot of the same criteria as a wholesaler. And what's the burst strategy? Sorry. So buy, rehab, rent, mm -hmm. refinance, repeat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just want to make sure that's all of them in the right order. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, you're buying this property. Oh, I'm not going to go through it. You guys can look up a burrs. It's everywhere. <laughs> Um, but if you are going through and buying a good Burr property, you have mm -hmm. to make sure it's a good deal. Not only are you buying equity, so as soon as you buy this property, you've actually already made money just based off of the equity that's in it if you're getting a discounted deal, which right. you should be, especially if it's a Burr property because you're going to need it. Mm -hmm. um, along with that, you have, you're going to own this property. It's not a one-time payment. So mm -hmm. throughout these courses of years, we're not looking to buy these properties and hold on to them for a year, three years, five years. We want to hold on to them for ever right. for as long as possible um so you have market appreciation that goes up every single year okay so even like this unforeseen equity is you know technically happening mm -hmm. like without you doing absolutely anything that is what i feel is extremely passive not necessarily the cash flow but the equity you're not doing anything for that equity that's just based off of the e economics of the system mm -hmm. whatever's going on especially location wherever you're located at yeah. So that's extremely passive. Um, some other things that 
come with buying rental properties that isn't necessarily true when it comes to active income streams like flipping or wholesaling is the tax benefits. So you, you have some huge tax write-offs when it comes to owning a rental property. The government really favors you to do that, actually, mm-hmm. where if you were to go through, buy a house, fix it up, sell it, you then have capital gains taxes, especially since there's a shorter period of time. Overall, we like to calculate just 30% tax no matter what. So, yeah, talk to your tax professional. Though. Yeah, I'm not a CPA by any means, yeah. so, you know, talk to C- CPA. <laughs> <laughs> not me. Um, but yeah, so typically, like, if we were to go through and make $100,000 on a flip, we actually have to take 30% of that $30,000 and throw it into a whole separate tax account mm-hmm. for whenever it comes time to, you know, file taxes right. April, whenever you do it. And with a rental property, it's actually beneficial because there's so many advantages, such as depreciation. So as soon as, since you're holding on to these properties, you're not going to sell it, so you have no capital gains taxes associated with it. You have, you're just keeping it you now have depreciation as well. So any of these, the rehab project that you're putting into the property is now considered a write-off when it comes time for tax season. Like yeah. Let's say you, you bought a property for 100,000, you put 50,000 worth of work into it, and it pays later on for like, let's say 300,000, mm-hmm. so hope. But that $50,000 is actually a write-off. Something else that I wasn't extremely too sure of, I don't even know if it's still 100% true, yeah. but the interest that you're paying on these rental properties is also a write-off. I believe so. I think so. It's also a write-off at the end of the year. Don't quote us on that. Yeah, don't quote us because this is something we're still trying to learn, figure out. Mm -hmm. But from what I've heard is Mm -hmm. we're paying like 9.125% interest on our one property, which I'm just going to throw it out there. Our monthly payment is roughly $3,300 and the 9 point whatever percent interest makes up about 3,000 of that. That's crazy. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, like our principal is only like it's horrible. 300 bucks a month. Yeah. Absolutely insane. So technically, if you have that $3,000 of interest payments for a month, mm-hmm. that's $36,000 $36, yeah. $36, a year of write-offs, not including all the depreciation that right. you've already done to the property. So that's another way of just making money. Also, in terms of taxes, you can do a 1031 exchange mm-hmm. where let's say that you did buy a rental property. You get, went through, got it fixed up. No, executed the burst strategy properly. Yeah. Hopefully you're in the deal for zero dollars. You now have a cash flowing asset. Let's say it appraised for, you know, double what you had bought it for. Mm -hmm. But you now want to you think you can move that equity that you have in that property and that capital into another property Mm -hmm. that might, you know, still need some work. There's some value add opportunity there. Then you can go ahead and do a ten thirty one exchange. So even though you're selling this property, you can still avoid all the capital gains taxes from it and just yeah. defer that into the next property that you're buying. So it's not that it's necessarily going away because at some point you are going to have to pay these taxes yeah. that you just deferred over a period of time. Technically, you continue to 1031 exchange these properties, though. When are you ever going to pay that? Yeah. Right? And, I mean, I guess with with all you had to say there, um, you're still dealing with all these – little headaches no absolutely yeah. i'm not here to say like it's by not. headaches i mean tenants right so once you do start scaling and you get to a point where it's ten thousand units or so ten thousand doors, and not even at ten thousand doors like we can talk about 10 units no no i'm saying when you're at 10 units you're gonna have headaches yeah when you're at 50 units you're gonna have headaches mm-hmm. once you're actually bringing enough monthly income to go ahead and build up your property management team, Mm -hmm. like an in-house property management team, I don't recommend hiring out to a property manager. Um, We haven't done it yet, so I mean, I can't speak from experience, but Mm -hmm. from based off of what I've heard from other investors in our area, kind of what they've experienced, it's not always the most pleasant thing. Because you can't really win because if you hire them, they don't care for the property as much as you do, so they're just going to leave it as trash basically exactly and you just gotta kind of manage micromanage them even Mm -hmm. more so you're just always babysitting and yeah you don't win you don't win with regular management and you don't win with property management even if you have the right systems in place you can kind of maneuver around things but you're still gonna have to be involved so it's not technically a hundred percent passively it's true passive income it's true when it's in terms of the cash flow it's not 100 percent passive because you're Mm -hmm. still involved in terms of appreciation that's passive Yeah. Because that's not something you're actually working for. That's just something that naturally happens over a period of time. 
But people would have to wait a long time before they quit their job. That's true, unless you scale fast. Yeah, and you can hope that your cash out refinances do amazing and you can cash out, but exactly, that's not always the story. No. You could lose $100,000. From my experience, you can lose $160,000. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but at the end of the day, we were still negative 16000 into that deal. Mm -hmm. So still win. Yeah. And it is cash flowing. Walked away with 16K, yeah. Right, and we're, we are cash flowing. and It is pure cash flow. Mm -hmm. It's not like we're have a vacancies or any big maintenance things that are going on in that did, property. Did, um, for the one apartment, is the electric, did they take care of that? Which one? The apartment one, that electric. I thought about that. Yo, I was in the shower and I was thinking That's about that. That's a good that. question because we already gave, <laughs> Yo, we gave him a thousand when, bucks. Like. When you're in real estate and you're doing business, you'll think of things in the shower before mm -hmm. you go to sleep in your <laughs> dreams. <laughs> you're like, did I do that? <laughs> <laughs> I was on FaceTime with this girl last night. Sorry to go a little sidetracked here. I was on FaceTime with this girl last night and we were in the middle. She was in the middle of some conversation completely mm -hmm. unrelated to real estate. And I had this thing pop in my head real quick. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, shoot. I was like, I forgot to mention that I have equitable interest on this property that I just listed. Yeah, yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah. For that I know property. what you're talking so about. I was like, those are just the little things. Yeah, it just pops like, up. It'll be in your head all the time, mm -hmm. no matter what you're doing. I got <laughs> so many notes and reminders on my phone. It's crazy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I still got to do that, actually. I haven't, I haven't added that in the description yet. Yeah. Oh, speaking of which, I'm actually meeting somebody there right after this. Oh, oh I got to give you the key. Mm -hmm. Okay. You have it on you? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, anyways, back to passive versus active. Mm -hmm. All right, so let me go. I feel like I kind of won that. No, you didn't win. Yeah. I don't know. Like, if someone is older or even a younger, like, they need money, they have a job. They're, they just can't live off of that so-called cash flow of a couple hundred dollars a month and Correct. something goes out like that. Like, yeah. you need a good amount of money if you're – you don't need – necessarily money to do rental properties you can just dive in like we did mm -hmm. being broke but mm -hmm. you're gonna have some scary months <laughs> yeah it's all with the uh, the risk tolerance yeah had a scary year <laughs> so who is who is somebody that you think is not fit for an active income stream active so we're not doing passive well, you we'll go get back to, to, I'll, I'll question myself with the okay. same question after you. Who shouldn't do active? Who I mean, we, we haven't even done <clears throat> all the active streams, though. Okay. Well, yeah. We can continue. Okay. Um, so, the we, next one. Yeah, we can go through to my favorite, actually. Fix them. Novations. Okay, let's do Novations. All right. So, Novation basically is like a wholesale deal on the market. So it would be listed, which is amazing because you're able to not only just sell to a cash buyer, but sell to a regular buyer, which they'll be willing, willing to pay more for the property. Right. And with the property staying in the seller's name and you not actually purchasing it and it going into your name, you're able to sell to a FHA buyer, VA buyer, government loans, period. Right. Mm -hmm. So that really no helps a lot. Period. No seasoning period. So that's definitely a good thing you want to you know, utilize whenever you're dealing with deals. Um, so that's a major pro right there. Like no, that's, abs absolutely. that's like the main pro I would say of being able to one of them get bigger wholesale or novation deals, more money for right. more bang for your buck. Yeah. Cause <laughs> anytime that you're able to throw something on the market, you're going to get top dollar versus if you were trying to do a strictly off market mm -hmm. wholesale deal. And I mean, it all depends on how you negotiate it. So like sometimes you can Tell the seller you'll pay for the realtor fees and closing calls. Sometimes you may split that with the seller. Sometimes you may go in there, do some work to the property. Like every investor has a different strategy when it comes to novations. Um, honestly, you have low risk still because you have no ownership of it and you can just sell to those, you know, bigger chunk of buyers. That's the main pros, I would say. A con to innovations is, let's say one of your strategies for innovation is that you go in there and you actually do add some money in fixing up the property before it gets listed to the market. Mm -hmm. Whether you're just paying 3000 bucks for a simple drunk removal, like let's say that the seller has a lot of stuff in there that you know mm -hmm. you got to clear it out before you take pictures, throw it on the MLS, that kind of thing. So your $3,000 in there. And then also, let's say you needed to you know do something small, like you wanted 
to repaint the whole inside and maybe add some new flooring mm -hmm. in the kitchens and bathrooms. Um, there's still, that takes money. That takes time. Mm -hmm. And what happens if a property doesn't sell on the market now that you already have your money invested there? Because mm -hmm. up front, you have a price already set with the seller. Like, no matter what, once this property sells, you're going to get this number. That's our agreement. Let's say it hits the market. You might have overcompensated for what your potential ARV on that property could be, mm -hmm. which is why we always do conservative, right? We don't take the top-notch property that's sold in that area. We like to look for a more middle ground median. Yeah. Um, also based off of just the quality of our product. So the property itself and what kind of condition is that in in comparison to these other ones that have sold. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, like you could throw fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 into an innovation deal, you yeah. know, just get try to get it market ready. You throw it on the market, it doesn't sell. Maybe not twenty. Maybe not twenty. I'm sure. That I people, mean, some people, I'm sure people may. do all the Some time. people may. Yeah. I don't know. We haven't done twenty. I think our highest was like we have five k. Yeah, it was like five. <laughs> or seven. It wasn't yeah. much at all. Um, yeah. But yeah, so that's another issue, though, or another risk, I should say. Mm -hmm. It's like, what if it doesn't? Whose pocket's that coming out of? That's your own pocket. That is your own pocket. <laughs> So that's definitely a form of risk that you have with Novations. Although I absolutely love Novations. And I think that it, it you also get to not have to pay for holding costs. You don't have to pay for borrowing this money. You don't have to pay, you know, utilities, taxes, insurance, anything mm -hmm. of that nature. So it's a huge bonus that it just stays in the seller's name or the owner's, the main owner's name. Mm -hmm. right? um, yeah. I think that's it. I don't for really innovations. have any more cons yeah. for it, honestly. It's innovations, like, it's solid. It's pretty solid. You just got to make sure you run your numbers right. That's right. It. You yeah. could also get screwed if then your seller decides to not sell anymore, though. It's like not, not only do you have the side of like it doesn't sell for how much you want it to, but mm -hmm. now it has come to the point where the seller, after you went and fixed up their property, they're like, oh, I no longer want to sell. But you're, you're taking that risk by yeah. doing that stuff. Right, exactly. Yeah. So you are taking the risk. Mm -hmm. um, so just don't overdo <laughs> yeah, I, yeah I can't think of any other negatives when it comes to innovations it's yeah. a pretty pretty risk free way of investing in real estate yeah. and you don't really need much money for that either it's going to be the same thing as this wholesaling like, mm -hmm. you're going to have to have an earnest money deposit actually um, no. yes do yes you? they do eh, well, it just depends to, just to yeah. get it into escrow just to open escrow open escrow um, yeah a dollar. I right. mean, we we do a hundred. We do a hundred, but um, yeah, yeah. I mean, like you don't <clears throat> have to do work to it. Like people just some people don't. We we like to do some things to it. Um, we right, know someone that just <clears throat> did some power washing, cut some bushes out, and made a hundred and twenty k. You know, on an innovation. But then karma bit him in the butt later. Remember when um their other innovation deal that oh, yeah. decided. <laughs> Not to. Yeah. yeah. Poor guys. <laughs> but um, if you're watching, we love you. Yeah. <laughs> we love you. <laughs> I'm sorry that happened to you. Yeah. Honestly, like that's horrible. It sucks. Um, yeah. So. I think that's pretty much it for innovations. That's um, true. So for my. Flips. Yeah. My other active would be flips. If I'm being straight up, like I don't love flips. You don't like flips. I don't love them. Uh, if it's like a cupcake, is that what they call it? Cupcake flip? Or what What do they call it? Lipstick, lipstick, lipstick on a pig? <laughs> a lipstick flip? A lipstick on the pig flip. That, my very first flip was a lipstick flip, if you want to call it that. No. So lipstick on a pig is necessarily whenever you have like a really bad property and you're just trying to make it look pretty. Okay. So your no, property wasn't bad. By no, no. Case. So like, I don't even know what they call it then. Yeah, yours was just a light cosmetic. Cosmetic. Um, cosmetic yeah. Cosmetic flip. flip. Yeah. So, all right, so I like fix and flips because, number one, profit margins can be great, right? Mm -hmm. They can be great, you know, because— I feel like I feel too confident in our market. I think that's my issue. <clears throat> yeah, like, I don't know. Because like, I, I really like the idea of fix and flips. I just honestly really like the idea of mm -hmm. taking this ugly property, and I get to design it. I get to pick out what materials. I get to pick out what walls are coming down. Yeah. I can choose the whole layout of the house. Like, I, I like being able to do that. We do that with the rentals. Yeah, but it's not the same. Like, I'm not, I don't know. And it's crazy. Like, my mindset around it. So, like, my first fix and flip, we made $61,000, I believe. Yeah. So, like, 
it's crazy. You would think my mindset would be, let's I do love fixing flips. flips. Yeah. But um, <laughs> no, the process was so easy. Well, it, it wasn't, it was easy, simple, but like stressful. Cause it was my first one. I was doing it with a partner and the partner left the country and I'm kind of like stuck. Like, I don't know what to do. <laughs> he went to the, he went to the country that there was currently that a there war, was war going, on. going on. So I was like still scared. Like I, I I wasn't sure if he was going to survive because there's literally bombs going off and stuff. All for a girl, right? I was just stressing. I was like, hopefully he's living. And then, you know. <laughs> yeah, you didn't know what was going on. This is like right as we became partners, too. You I were, was stressing. You were in the mix of this. And then the TV show thing, we were filming that, too. Oh, and yeah. then it was a lot going on. Yeah. Um, that was a busy time. But, yeah. So, I mean, made good money from that. You can make good money from fix and flips. Um, I mean, that's You're pretty much it. I feel like in, in regards pros? to pros, yeah. yeah. A I lot guess of the cons. cool thing is you can be the designer, but it's like, come on that's now, cool. you want to make money. It's not about the design. That's true. Yeah, it is. It's. I mean, at the end of the day, we're all doing this, so it is about the design. Like you have to have a good design, oh, no, you but have like to. it's about making money for that. Yeah, of course. If you're gonna operate a business, you just want to make sure you don't fail. Yeah, so that's not a business. That's just a hobby that you're losing money. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, there's a lot of cons when it does come to fix and flipping. Mm -hmm. So such as it's still a job. You're mm -hmm. still managing contractors at this point. You're still a lot of times you're picking out your own materials, which some people might thoroughly enjoy doing yeah. and like creating your own design. But those are all things that you have to do. Yeah. Unless you hire a contractor who does materials and labor. But at that point, you might not be getting the best quality because these contractors want to save money on the materials so they can put it back into their own pocket or their their team. Mm -hmm. um, which in return then might not give you the asking price that you were expecting. Right. So there's a lot of risk when it comes to fix and flipping. Like there's so many things that you could unveil while trying to fix this property. Like you might not even know that the entire foundation is crumbling beneath you. Like mm -hmm. this property could fall in or cave in at any second. Knock on wood, you don't buy something in that condition. Well, even if it is, just make sure you get it cheap enough. Yeah. Um, but yeah, those are just like a bunch of things that you could uncover. Like these hidden expenses, right? You watch it all the time, whether it's HGTV or you watch a real investor like ourselves go through and try to fix and flip. That budget's just going up and up. Like you might have like a set idea, like, oh, this should only take twenty thousand to go ahead, do new flooring, new paint, new cabinets, new countertops, and new bathroom vanities or a shower, something yeah. like that. But then you start going, you're like, oh, this this main plumbing is actually shot. We need to redo all this plumbing. Oh, that roof is actually just five layers of shingles on top of each other that have just been continuously patched that needs to be ripped off. You need a new roof. That's another $10,000. Mm -hmm. There's all kinds of things that could pop up. So it's very risky when it comes to that, especially if you don't have somebody on your team who is good when it comes to contracting and like inspections. Right. That's why I also recommend like if you're doing a fix and flip, try to get an inspection done on the property. We don't do that. Um, <laughs> We just bring our contractor and we just... We just trust God. We just hope that he knows what he's doing. <laughs> Which he does. He's a great guy. And <laughs> um, yeah, knock on wood, haven't had anything like that happen yet with like anything too major. We haven't had our setbacks here and there. What and else? like sewer line inspection. Right. Someone told us to shout out to... Who was that? Mike Nylinger. Mike Nylinger. Yeah. Brought that up. Yeah. Yep, yep. Um, and then what if your property doesn't sell for what you're hoping for? Let's say that, you know, you got to use... This one comparable that sold three months ago and you're hoping that you can get this property on the market in the next month things get delayed mm -hmm. contractors don't do their job gets fired you have these other expenses that pop up out of nowhere you gotta find the money for those it takes longer next thing you know you're six seven eight months in this project you can no longer use that comparable let's say that something else hasn't sold for that much since that period of time the only things that have sold recently similar to your property are like 20% less. Mm -hmm. Now all of a sudden your property looks like it's overpriced if you are still shooting for that original number yeah. where it might not be overpriced, but at the time that you're listing it, it actually is, right? You missed out like they would also uh, be losing money with interest payments too. Yeah, the holding costs. Yeah. Interest payments, um, insurance, utilities, those kinds of things. I will say we did have one scare it was a property out in Hershey that we thought we were going to make like 80K from it. And it, it was a wholesale. So basically where 
we bought it. Um, so it was in our name. And then we did some work to it. So like a super light flip, right? Yeah, and we then put it all, back on the market. Yeah, ripped out all the carpets, exposed the original hardwood flooring, tried to refinish those a little bit, tore down all the wallpaper, repainted the whole place, mm -hmm. did a lot of landscaping, and then just a lot of cleaning out in general. And still put it on the market at a discounted price, but... Yeah, like, there was a comparable literally on the same street, like, three doors down that sold for four oh five at yeah. the time. And, and we had it listed at... 279 two, Yeah, it was low. 279 So we were like, oh, this thing is going to sell like that. Right. And it wasn't in horrible condition. Like, it was definitely livable. Um, and it was summertime, too. So, like... It was great timing. Yeah. The kitchen was a little bit outdated. The bathrooms were a little outdated. Everything was functional, mm -hmm. you know. Decent property, huge two car garage, great backyard, everything. Yeah. Two weeks on the market, no offers. We're like, okay, this is a little odd. Let's just have some open houses, keep on marketing and stuff. Mm -hmm. Another two weeks go by, still nothing. Like, was it that long? Yeah. And then we're like, all right, what's, what's going on? We're getting a little nervous. Like, what's happening? And then during this time, we're like, maybe we should keep it. You know, it's a possibility. Maybe we should just do the flip ourselves. But then it's like, eh, it's too risky. We'd have to go back to our lender. But he didn't right. want to lend us this much in the first place, like, to do a flip. Because I think our initial thought was to do a flip. Yeah. He only wanted to lend us that certain amount, which only made sense for a wholesale. And we're like, no, you know, let's just wait it out and see. Hope for the best. Right. Yeah. So it's like over a month. It was probably a month and a half, I think. Maybe, maybe a month and a half, and then we finally got something in. But it's just scary because who knows? I could have just continued to sit on the market, and we would have just been, what? I don't even know. SOL. Like, yeah, it would have been bad. Yeah. And then all the interest payments just coming out of our account and stuff. So. And I think one of the main issues with that property, at least for example, is that we didn't really look at the floor plan. Mm -hmm. The floor plan was, floor plan was very janky. Yeah. It was like you weren't able to open any walls primarily because the addition that was built onto the house had an exterior wall that was then brick. Lo it was load bearing. It yeah. was brick and you couldn't knock that down to open it up at all. And then the basement steps right went right in between the living room and the kitchen. Mm -hmm. And like you can't knock the, you can't take out those walls because that's the basement steps right there. You would have to relocate the entire stairs. There was no way of really adding a fourth bedroom either. Mm -hmm. Like there was no kind of real value add opportunities there. And it was just a very strange layout to where you couldn't open up the place at all. Yeah. Where the comparable was completely open. It was a beautiful four bed, two and a half bath, I, I want to say. And that sold I think for, so. Right. So it sold for 405. So we thought, hell, at 279, like this is a. Right beside the hospital, right beside a really nice. Yeah. We were like, like this is a bargain. Yeah. It was just a great area. Eventually we did sell it. And yeah, we still ended thank up. Thank God. We still ended up walking away, I think, with like 19. But that made us start second guessing. I think it was twenty, but it made us second guessing. Um, wholesaling. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just because of that risk factor. But the last um, pa I don't know, active income would be. Uh, what is it? Or is that it? I mean, you got wholesale, novation, Novations. fix and flips, wholesale. Yeah, that's it, pretty much. It's pretty much everything. Yeah. Another thing we could also add is creative financing, but that's kind of like. It depends on what you do, like, because you can do a fix and flip that's creative. You can do... You can do a rental property. Rental that's creative. So that's yeah, that, kind of, like, in the middle. Area. Yeah. For sure. Um, so I think we touched on just about everything. Yeah. So I will... I'm going to ask myself the same question I asked you. Mm -hmm. Like, who isn't built for passive income? Who, you know, who shouldn't be doing buying rental properties, per se? I'm going to say anybody who is looking to – I just had it on my <laughs> – I had a great idea. Mm -hmm. Completely just skipped my brain. Oh, somebody who is not okay with delayed gratification. They want instant gratification. Mm. Somebody who is looking for a large check up front, like right away. Yeah. Those people are not suited for rental properties because you're not going to get money like that mm -hmm. unless you buy an extreme discount and then you do minimal amount of work and it appraises for a lot more than what you bought it for. Hopefully, you could do a cash out refi and try to recoup a lot of that sweat equity that you had gained into the property. Mm -hmm. But even from our experience, that doesn't always happen. Yeah. Which it still should have. It's BS that it didn't. Yeah. Um, anyways, things happen. 
But yeah, anyone who's looking for that instant gratification, don't buy rental properties. Another person I'd say isn't suited for that delayed gratification or, you know, rental properties, passive income would be, uh, I don't want to say like old people, but <laughs> people who are looking to, you know, like fully retire here soon. Yeah. Like they made a good amount of money in their job and they kind of have like a lump sum of capital saved up that they could then go through and use as a down payment on a rental property. You're going to have headaches. Mm -hmm. Like, I hate to say it, but it's true. You could buy yeah. you could buy a turnkey rental property. There are some amazing tenants in there. You're still gonna have things pop up no matter what. Yeah, just invest in like an AI bot that does stock trading for you. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, that's an option. But yeah, I would like I still love real estate at the end of the day, and I would definitely recommend throwing your money into maybe a REIT or a syndication or mm -hmm. a fund of some sort um, that's still real estate related. Yeah, well, stocks are very. Or, mm -hmm. um, not safe, but they are a good option as well. Yeah. Um. Some some a lot safer than others. Like buy a index fund. Don't just buy individual stocks if you're looking for a less risky route. Um. But yeah, overall, I still think that passive income and owning these rental properties are going to be the best. Going to beat any kind of active income stream at the end of the day, mm -hmm. as long as you're willing to delay that gratification for enough period of time. Like, let's just say you make, let's say you have 100 properties, you're making $30,000 a month of cash flow, right? Mm -hmm. So you own that for five years. So you're at, what, 30000 a month times 12 is 36000 36 times 5. Too much math I just did for myself. Uh, what is that, 130000 100, something like that. Somewhere around there, right? So, sure, let's say that happens. Let's say you have a house that gets torn to pieces, mm -hmm. right? Whatever happens. You have a tornado. You don't have a tornado insurance. Bless you. Bless you. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're okay. um, You just lose 130000 That's all the cash flow that you've accumulated over the five past five years from these, I don't remember how many properties I said. Um, a hundred. Thirty thousand a month from a hundred properties. That's that's pushing it. <laughs> no, that's $300 the door. Oh, okay. So I did my math right. I think, yeah. Let's hope so. Anyways, so, yeah, you could have something major happen where you lose all that money at one time, right? Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, though, you still paid down all of those mortgages over the past five years. You hopefully still bought all these properties at a discounted price. And ever since you had bought those properties, they've also increased in value 10%. And you got a lot of tax write-offs as well. Once again, saving you money. Not only that, but you could also save money by potentially living in one of these 100 units that you own. You're mm -hmm. now not spending any money for rent. You don't have your own mortgage coming out. You know, that's being covered by your other tenants that are in this building. There's just so many different things that kind of like, I think they call it the stack method. Yeah. Where they stack on top of each other. And it's like, sure, even if one thing goes wrong, you still have six other different things that are going right for you. Gotcha. So it's like, I feel as though... It, in the long run, it's a lot res less risky than any kind of wholesaling innovations or fix and flips combined. Mm -hmm. And hopefully at some point, you get to the degree that you're not involved in any of it, right? You scale to 10,000 units, you have an entire team built out under you, and hopefully any situation that comes up within those rental properties can be covered by your team and doesn't even have to make it to your desk right? or, right. or to you in any kind of way. So that's definitely the end goal at some point. Um, and yeah, so I don't know, obviously there's pros and cons to both of them. Yeah. And I think we miss, we, uh, missed out on Airbnbs, which we don't, we haven't done one or anything like that. That would go Air towards the active that income. That would go towards active. Yeah. Um, which it's a good combination of both though, to be honest. I mean, there's midterm rentals too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There's so much stuff in real estate, but we went over basically the main things. So... Um, what we do and what we think, well, I can't speak for you, but mm -hmm. what you probably think that everybody should do who wants to be involved in real estate investing is to actually do both, right? So, Well, wait, I got to talk about um, people that shouldn't do passive. Oh, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I already kind of touched on that, but in case you have different ones, go ahead. Well, if you're not disciplined, if you're not motivated, if you're lazy, if you think... Things that's, are going to come to you easily. That goes for the active easily. income, too, though. Anyone who's flipping, wholesaling, if you're 
lazy, not motivated, not driven. Well, you could just buy a deal off a wholesaler for a rental property. But if you're not willing to go out and put the work in, then nothing's going to happen. Then it's like, don't even waste time starting the business, you know? Yeah. Um, I guess it also does have like, don't expect things to happen overnight. Cause I mean, some deals, it's crazy. Cause I just made a video about our fastest deal probably took about an hour's worth of time to get it like that. And we made 2,500. The referral? Uh, the referral. And then we just gave it to our buyer and he saw it like five minutes later. He's like, I want it. Made 2,500 from that. And then the longest deal follow up was probably like a whole long year um, I on the I, one we I, just did in December. I had a faster deal than the hour long one. What? My uh, my Evergreen Street deal. Oh yeah. I called up the seller, literally figured out he was like, "I want fifty thousand, not going any lower." I mm -hmm. said, "Okay." Hung up immediately. Called the buyer. Said he wants fifty thousand for this property. Are you in the area? He's like, "I'm one minute away." I was like, "Go check." Yeah, it that's out. the same. It literally was I, the same thing. I was like, "Go check it out." He was yeah. like, "All right." He went up to. It. He was like. How much did you get on our contract for? I was like, it's not our contract. He wants 50. He was like, all right, I'll give you 55 sign unseen. I said, okay. Yeah. Paper, paper, sign, sign. That's what I'm saying. Uh, okay. <laughs> so maybe it was less than an hour for me. 10 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Ten pretty minutes. fast. Yeah. Um, 5K. So we got to beat that. Yeah. Got to beat that. Time. Although it still takes 30 days to close. Yeah. And But just for the amount of work you put into it. Right. Literally. Yeah. Less than 30 I remember minutes. I Snapchatted like my uh, my group chat of friends and I was mm -hmm. like just made 5k in 10 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah, if you're lazy, don't do real estate wholesaling straight up. If you're lazy, just don't do any real estate. Just don't do real estate. You're either going to screw over your tenants or you're going you're gonna to screw over your employees or you're going to screw over some homeowners. So Just work a W2 job the rest of your life. Yeah. <laughs> Be a sad sack of shit. <laughs> But, um, <laughs> no, nah, but if you're like, if you're full, like if you're serious about your goals, if yeah. you're serious, there's a lot of people that they reach out. They're like, I want to get into wholesaling. I want to do real estate, blah, blah, blah. But like, you can just tell they don't have that drive. They're not. Oh my gosh. Yeah. You know? And do you ever think, so this might just be me. Mm -hmm. Do you ever have people who they come off as driven? They might be driven. They might be motivated. Mm-hmm. But they're just not mentally there enough to even get started in, like, real estate. <laughs> I mean, I don't think I had someone like that. Like I've had people where it's like, I'll go through and try to explain the most basic of basic concepts. Yeah. And it's like, they're incompetent to understand anything I'm saying. Mm -hmm. And it's not like I'm using difficult terminology, mm -hmm. even. It's Did like, they go to college? No. Okay. Well, I dropped out. <laughs> so. Yeah, so <laughs> I. <laughs> but no, I'm just saying, like, I think there's just some people who genuinely are built for They may not just be business, built for it. Yeah. Owning a business. Not everyone can be an doing entrepreneur. real estate. Yeah, it's very true. Mm -hmm. It's like, even no matter how motivated you are, it's like, I'm sorry. It's just not meant to be. Good. It's, God has a different calling for you. Yeah, you might you know? go be a pro athlete one day. Right. Do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so... Yeah, I think that's pretty much it for the qualifications, I guess, in regards to what we prefer. I definitely prefer, out of everything, I would say rental properties, um, just because of the passive income and the benefits and everything like that. Yeah. But what we did that was wrong is we did focus on rental properties at one point in our business, and, and we neglected. scaled that portfolio, neglected the um, active income side with like wholesaling and fixing, flipping and all that stuff. And that's when it's like we were scaling with properties, but then our bank account was just decreasing and it wasn't looking too pretty. <laughs> we hit rock bottom on that thing. <laughs> right. So what we realized. Um, you need to do both. Yeah. You got to do both. You need you, to do both. You got to make that active income and utilize that to pay yourself, but also use that money to um, buy more properties. Yeah, and in case you have any, like, CapEx expenditures that pop up out of nowhere, mm -hmm. you're not trying to scuffle around to try to find where you can get this five, ten thousand dollars $10,000 from. Yeah. It's like, okay, no, I have my active streams of income over here that are producing me hopefully ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 a month mm -hmm. where I can then use some of that capital and supplement it into my rental portfolio Yeah. whenever something does pop up like that. Or even if you're looking to go and just do a traditional method of getting a conventional loan on a turnkey rental property, you now have money, though, that you can do that with. Right. And you're not always trying to find these deeply discounted deals, which, honestly, though, like trying to find these deeply discounted deals, 
you should always be doing no matter what. And I mean, it's going to be a different story. We're actually in the next couple of weeks here going to have uh, a real estate attorney uh, that also owns his own title company to kind of break down what's going on in the real estate space. Like Some, the legal, there's a lot of the stuff legal that's things, the laws that are happening, you know, surrounding around at least uh, Pennsylvania. Yeah. Pennsylvania about real estate wholesaling, about assignments, double closes, novations, and it's getting pretty POAs. crazy. It's getting crazy. So it's getting scary. Man. We're going to have him come on here and kind of break down everything because for new real estate wholesalers, apparently you you're, may need to get licensed. You're going to want to watch this. So having a real estate license and wholesaling. Yeah. Yeah. That means I'm getting my license. Oh, I'm also, um, Eventually here soon, I'm going to be getting my mortgage license. I still got to go through and do that. Yeah. So I do want to get that started, though. So in case anyone needs a mortgage, please yeah. hit me up. <laughs> <laughs> well, hit Stephanie up because she has the social I don't media. got the mortgage license, though. No, but you got the social media. <laughs> nah, hit him up. Somewhere. Yeah, yeah try to find me. <laughs> but, yeah, I think we're going to end it there. I think we touched based on just yeah, about everything. that was a good job, like, going back and forth with the pros and cons of active income versus passive income. And I'm curious, like, comment down below, what do you prefer? Do you prefer the pass passive income or active income? And if it is active, like, what kind of active income do you prefer? Also, make sure you guys comment any ideas you guys want to hear us talk about or any special guests you guys want us to have on. And make sure you guys are subscribed on YouTube and follow us on Apple and Sp Spotify. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah, there we go. Yep, yep. Oh, TikTok, Instagram, too. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Um. Yeah, no, I think that's about everything. So please look forward to the next couple episodes because we do have some actually really good guests coming on. Mm -hmm. um, next couple are going to be very educational, I feel. Yeah. Um, besides, like, the entertainment side. This one I think was kind of fun, just going back and forth. And at the end of the day, Stephanie and myself, we both agree with each other, and she was the one who didn't want to argue active because she wasn't too passionate <laughs> about that side. Because mm -hmm. um, we do both really enjoy passive income and owning these rental properties and having all those different streams of income coming in. But I do like the scaling part of like the business and stuff. This, it's great this, talking to sellers and, you know. Yeah, no, absolutely. I love going on those appointments and everything else that we do. Yeah. So on that note, you know, use active income to fund your passive income, incorporate both, yeah. have a high risk tolerance if you can, and just keep doing it. Keep grinding. Yeah. Eventually you're going to succeed. You'll figure it out. So it took us a while, but we're getting there. Yeah, most definitely. So we hope you guys enjoyed this uh, episode. Like I said, if you did, give it a thumbs up. But with that being said, we'll catch you guys in the next one. Peace. Peace.